after the invasion, it was before the fall of Paris. Anyway, we were escorting bombers. As soon as we have enough of the enemy planes leave, that uh, the bombers are not in any additional danger, well, we could choose to, to chase one of the enemy planes down when they were going away from the fight. So we fought from 30,000 to about 5,000, doing every kind of maneuver you could think of, or, or trying to trick the other one. Uh, but I finally got some hits on his engine. Well, that started smoking. It made him nervous. So he said, well, now I'm going to fly over Paris. They got thousands of gunners in Paris. They could all shoot at him. And they gave me a better chance to be clear of it. Well, I followed him right on in over Paris. And he was getting even more nervous. So he chose the route to fly under the Eiffel Tower. And I was hot on his tail. I was, you know, he came through, I came right through. But when he had to pull up, you don't have a choice of going anywhere except straight ahead at first until you get some altitude. So he was sitting right in my gun sight. What finished him off there as he pulled out of the trip under the Eiffel Tower. And funny thing about it, years later, I'm still running into people, some Parisians, some uh, people who just happened to be in Paris during the occupation. And they say, we celebrated for three days because you got that trick in. So uh, I thought that was pretty nice to have it confirmed by the viewers and so forth, the people who saw the event. I didn't report it. When we got over there in the situation with the PR people and everything, and we also found out that some of the pilots were claiming some doubtful claims and having their uh, wingmen swear to it and so forth, I decided I wouldn't get into that, so I never put in a claim of any kind. But uh, the other fellas, I had to tell it but not to the officials. <laughs> we uh, were assigned the Russian shuttle mission. We were to Russia, we fly missions out of Russia, fly to Italy from Russia, by missions out of Italy. The uh, Spitfires and P-39s missions were limited by their fuel capacity to two-hour missions. And when we were assigned to go to Russia and Italy, they uh, sent over an Australian who had flown with the RAF two tours, no mission over two hours. Well, he was on my wing. His first mission that was going to exceed two hours. It actually was eight hours by the time we landed in grass field in Russia. He did lose enthusiasm rather rapidly and <laughs> the hours piled up. But uh, we had a lot of fun. And Russia was very unfriendly. They, uh, had some tents set up with folding bunks, signs of and told me where I was supposed to sleep. I see some P-39 sitting over there on the same field that we landed. I started over to them and the Russian guards, stop it! Made it clear they wanted me to stop. So I stopped and here I was, American pilot, with hundreds of hours in a P-39, more than they had, though we hadn't been sending them to them very long. And uh, <clears throat> they did something to increase the altitude. P-39 was sluggish at altitude. The way we had it was not supercharged. So 
So I figured they supercharged it and got good flight characteristics at altitude. Well, what an interesting thing that happened on that shuttle mission. We stayed there a while and flew missions out of Russia back to Germany. And then, then we ran into some beet vodka. Now, I was familiar with potato vodka. I never run into beet vodka before. I thought it would be real nice to bring some along and uh, share with my buddies. So I uh, eliminated ammunition and put in beet vodka. So I was leading. I was safe as I could be. I didn't need anything. We got over Palesti on the way to Italy. Ran into a bunch of German 109s. But they took off and ran. They didn't want to dabble with us at all. They just leave and go. The last one that was running away rolled over, bailed out. He may have had engine trouble or uh, nerve trouble or I don't know what happened to him, but he rolled over and bailed out. And of course, the officials rule at the closest plane too. So in a situation like this, I was leading the flight. I was the closest one to him. But I could never claim one that had no ammunition except beet vodka. So <laughs> that, that was not exactly the time to be claiming planes now. Willie Messerschmitt's fabled BF-109 was manufactured in greater numbers than any other production aircraft. Almost 34,000 were built. Usually referred to as the ME-109, at the time the aircraft was conceived, it was designated the BF-109. B because the maker was located in Bavaria, and F because the company was called Flugwerk. It was only when Willy Messerschmitt gained full control of the company that the ME prefix was assigned. Throughout the 30s and during the Second World War, Willy Messerschmitt endured a dogged relationship with Erhard Milch, who had gained high position with the fledgling state airline Lufthansa and later with the German Air Ministry, more often known as the RLM. A close friend of Milch was killed piloting a Messerschmitt-designed transport plane, the M20, on its first flight. Milch was to blame Messerschmitt over the accident, a grudge that was to last for years. Fortunately, Messerschmitt had cultivated a relationship with Hermann Göring, who ultimately became Milch's superior. To get his first Luftwaffe fighter contract, Messerschmitt's BF-109 had to compete with an advanced Heinkel design, the HE-112. There's no question that Heinkel aircraft was the better looking aircraft. But, um, and incidentally, they, when it came to the test pilots at Rechlin, they gave the 112 the better report considerably be better over the 109. But Udet decided that he was under pressure to produce numbers of aircraft rather than quality. And he realized quite rightly that the 109 was far easier to produce in numbers than the 112, basically because the undercarriage on the 109 was an integral part of the fuselage, so the fuselage and the wings could be produced separately and then joined at a later date. In the end, the competition was won by the 109 and a legend was born. The 109 first saw service in Spain. Along with other modern German aircraft like the Stuka, the 109 was tested in actual combat conditions. The lessons gained 
would later be applied to a much larger conflict in the skies over Britain. In Spain, it became clear that the 109 lacked range and endurance. Its slender lines made for greater speed, but left little space for fuel. One possible solution to this problem was to use the BF-110 to tow the smaller 109 to the combat area, thus preserving its limited fuel for fighting. Novel though the idea was, the towing technique proved impractical for all but glider warfare. However, a few years later, when Germany was suffering from the relentless heavy bombing of the US 8th Air Force, the 109 was employed as a test aircraft in towing a unique glider fighter concept offered by the Blum and Voss company. The BV-40 was a very low-cost fighter glider that would have been coupled to a BF-109. When the tiny Blum and Voss design was in a position above the American bombers, it was released to attack them, using its two 30mm cannons and their limited stock of ammunition. The BV-40 was so small, its pilot had to lie on a mattress in a prone position. However, the BV-40 relied upon its diminutive size to avoid US gunners. Only seven BV-40s were built before the project was abandoned, probably because the ME-163 was a slightly more practical and self-contained concept. 109s were also pressed into service for clandestine missions, dropping spies and saboteurs behind enemy lines. Special capsules could be attached to both wings, each containing a single parachutist. An often overlooked feature of the 109 was its system of leading edge slats on the forward surface of the wings. These made for better handling and shorter takeoffs. Interestingly, the concept had been developed and patented by the British Hanley Page Company, and Messerschmitt had to pay for the use of the invention. The slats proved so successful that they were also used in Messerschmitt's 410 and legendary 262 jet fighter. The 262 had another link to the BF-109 owing to the fact that the jet's nose wheel assembly is actually a single main wheel strut from the BF-109's narrow gate undercarriage. The 109's narrow gate undercarriage was always a challenge when it came to landing or takeoff, even under normal conditions. At one point in the war, the Kriegsmarine had high hopes for its sole aircraft carrier, the Zeppelin. It was always assumed that the Zeppelin would be equipped with Stukas and 109s. The Stukas wide gate undercarriage would have been suitable for aircraft carrier landings, but the standard 109 arrangement was not. Accordingly, Messerschmitt set to work to modify the wings so that the wheels could function in a more stable wide gate fashion. This aircraft was designated the ME 155. The Zeppelin never put to sea, and the 155 was abandoned, only to be later resurrected by the Blum and Voss company as a very high-altitude fighter concept. But this came too late to help an ailing Germany. Messerschmitt followed the 109 with the BF-110. Although this later became successful in several other roles, it was never suitable for the long-range bomber escort mission. Messerschmitt quickly offered the 210 as an alternative. But this proved to be a failure, and so the ME-410 was rushed into development. As a precaution, in 1942, the company was ordered to develop a backup aircraft based on existing 109 parts and using two fuselages which enabled the creation of a totally new aircraft employing a minimum number of new parts. The ME-109Z Zilling was made as a single-seat, very long-range heavy fighter. 
It might have shown great promise if the two prototypes had not been badly damaged in an Allied bombing raid. This loss demonstrated that Germany needed a homeland defender more than a bomber escort at this stage of the war. In addition, the ME262 jet was close to delivery, and this groundbreaking design could have been a real game changer if they had arrived in time. Possible proof of the ME-109Z's viability came with the US North American P-82 twin Mustang. Independently, the German designer of the P-82 chose to follow exactly the same approach as the ME-109Z. 270 twin Mustangs were actually produced and served in Korea and the United States as night fighters. In another pairing, BF-109s were flown with other aircraft during the Mistral missions. These occurred when Germany's fortunes were declining and the Wehrmacht were looking to develop a new type of flying bomb. The concept would use a disposable unmanned bomber filled with explosives, but guided by a piloted 109. Gliders were first used to prove this concept, but eventually two engine bombers were employed. The BF-109 was produced in greater numbers than any aircraft in history. It served the Luftwaffe and other air forces well, and it proved more than an adequate fighter for Germany until it was supplanted by the FW-190. Even then, it remained in active service and production until the end of the war. The BF-109 was one of aviation's great planes. I'm Colonel Bud Anderson, and I'm going to do a, you might say, a walk around on a P 51B Bravo airplane. Uh, this particular airplane right here is painted exactly like my airplane was painted in World War II. It's been restored by Jack Roush, and he's done a marvelous job of uh, restoring it. And one of the main features, of course, is the uh, Malcolm Hood, which is quite a Quite a modification on the uh, on the P-51Bs and, and and Cs. Bs and Cs had uh, what we call a birdcage canopy, and you opened it like this over the top, like that. And of course, it had slats on the thing. And of course, when you're looking out, uh, a damn slat is right there by your eye. And so these were marvelous improvement. Uh, for a pilot to uh, look around in aerial combat. Well, when you did a walk around in the morning, you usually uh, 
came out from operations and walked out to your airplane. Your crew chief would meet you uh, somewhere in the area. And then you go over the paperwork and sign the Form 1A, the um, uh, maintenance records on the airplane that uh, uh, that, that, the, that the military kept at the time uh, and discuss anything about the airplane if you wanted. Of course, this was my own personal airplane and I knew it very well and, uh, and I had a, a wonderful uh, crew, a ground crew. Uh, I flew all of my combat missions, well, 116, with uh, 480 hours and 20 minutes of combat flying without a single abort for any reason whatsoever. That's pretty remarkable, actually. Having said uh, what my uh, combat record was, uh, 116 missions without an abort, uh, leads me to my, uh, my crew chief story, which I like to tell uh, whenever I can. Uh, you know, I think you could imagine yourself being a, a crew chief of, a, of an airplane, World War II. Your pilot's doing the fighting and the dying, and uh, you're back here maintaining that airplane. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, if you're the crew chief, that's your airplane. And you're, you're a part of it. And when that guy gets a kill and puts it up in here, that's your kill too. The guys were very, uh, uh, very supportive and wanted to do their part. Uh, uh, just uh, incredible. And the story I like to tell, uh, my crew chief story, is about uh, my second tour when I, uh, I had a, uh, a P-51D uh, dog, the classic model over here. And it was camouflaged in this uh, dark green camo, completely, just about like this airplane here. And uh, it was my second tour, and Otto, Otto Heino had been uh, promoted to tech sergeant, and uh, crew chiefs were staff sergeants. So uh, he had a flight of uh, six airplanes to oversee. And so he handpicked a new crew chief for me, Mel Schooneman. And then, of course, the third member of my, my crew was uh, Leon Zimmerman, who was my armor. Uh, all three of those guys were, those were my crews uh, during World War II and also during my P-39 training. So uh, as the story goes in uh, my second tour, uh, I have the, the completely camouflaged uh, D, and uh, I think it was in November of uh, 1944. I remember it was uh, snowing over Germany, and it said snow had hit the night before, and I mean a big time snow, and all of northern Germany and northern Europe was, uh, was uh, in dense snow. And I looked down, we used to fly in the finger, fingertip four, uh, a leader and a wingman and a, a uh, element leader and a wingman. And I looked down against the, um, here's, a, here's a nice white surface right here with the f f flying of four. And at this point in time, uh, we weren't paying too much attention to the uh, paint schemes. And we had all green ones, we had all silver ones, we had uh, some that were in half, half camo and half silver. And I'm looking down at this snow, and which one stood out? Well, of course, the dark one stood out. The camouflaged airplane stood out. So I, I made a mental note to talk to my crew when I got back to the, after the mission. When I landed, I uh, got them together, and I said, you know, uh, it's snowing over there, and I'm going to finish my tour in the winter. Uh, whenever this thing is laid up for heavy maintenance, would you please depaint it, take the the um, the camo off of it, and make it a silver paint scheme? And I put it to him on a uh, on a base, tactical basis that it might save my butt. 
but frankly, uh, you know, I had another reason. Uh, that was one reason, but I kind of thought the, uh, the all silver airplanes looked a little cooler than the all commode airplanes. So I told them that, and I thought it would take, uh, you know, two or three days to do that. And I did tell them, when it's laid up for heavy maintenance, please repaint the airplane. So uh, I went in and uh, I was the operations officer and I decided that I wanted to fly the next day, put my name on the board and went home and forgot about it. Next morning after uh, breakfast and getting the briefing come out, I grabbed my chute in operations and I walked out to my revetment. I'm the closest, my, my revetment was uh, easy walking distance from operation. I had my parachute over my shoulder and I climb up over the revetment and I'm standing there looking down and here's my, my Mustang sitting there in gleaming aluminum. And I was really quite flabbergasted, you know. I thought, wow, did those guys think I gave them a direct order to do that? And then I looked at them closely, and I noticed their hands were uh, were raw. You know, the skin had been pushed off of them, and, uh, and they'd been rubbing and rubbing, and a little bit of blood on them. And that made me feel uh, really, uh, <laughs> made me feel like hell. I said, I wonder, did these guys think I gave them a direct order to, to paint that thing right there? And then I thought about it a little bit, and I said, no, you know, they wanted to do that. That was their contribution to the war. And uh, they, they wanted to just please me uh, however they could. And I just can't say enough about the crew chiefs of the world. So uh, after you uh, finish your paperwork and discussion with the crew chief, uh, they always had the airplanes just absolutely perfect and ready to go. And uh, uh, there wasn't much sense of uh, doing a walk around, but that's required. So we did a precursory walk around uh, to comply with the rules. The pilot will do a walk around. So, you walk around the airplane and just kind of check in here. You want to make sure the gas caps are closed. The gun bay doors are down tight and smooth. Come over here, check the ailerons, see the tabs hooked together. Come along here, look on the wing tip. See if you don't, make sure you don't have any busted lights. Uh, this one doesn't have them all. And it has an extra light. We didn't have that one. And then you got over here, check your leading edge just so it's small, smooth, landing light, make sure it's not cracked and on. Then we got here, uh, we would have a big 108-gallon um, uh, 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 fuel tank. It was just round, cylinder round and round on the end. And they were made out of uh, pressed paper and resin. And uh, we did that so that we wouldn't drop aluminum tanks over Germany and give them uh, aluminum to help manufacture airplanes. They were very successful. Uh, but you had to get rid of them as soon as they were empty or if you got into combat, of course, you jettisoned them immediately because they were a lot of extra drag and they would not stand a lot of airspeed. I can't remember what it was, but after a certain airspeed, they would shred. So, and uh, we did carry bombs uh, uh, briefly for about 30 days uh, after the uh, Normandy beachhead landing. Okay, check your bomb. Uh, you check the guns, and this is a, there's a difference on the B and the D, of course. Uh, the B model only had two guns, but they were also mounted differently. Uh, and there's, there's several production changes this in, in the, between the B and the D, but one of them, they, these guns are, are laying in here sideways, and I don't know which way they lay. Yeah, probably this way. And so the, the ammo doesn't feed in there directly like that. It feeds at an angle. And so we were having gun jams uh, when you were pulling G's and firing. 
the guns would jam and you had no way of uh, recharging them and all that. And we finally got that ironed out by having very clean uh, working guns and then putting uh, trays on top of the ammo so it wouldn't flop around. But when you're doing a walk around, you just check and make sure. They usually had tape over the things like that. You come around and check your tires. You know, the old saying, you fighter pilots come around and kick their tires. <laughs> but you just want to make sure that the tire was inflated. And you check uh, a lot of uh, things like that. Come under here and uh, check, the, uh, check any loose lines and stuff like that. These doors are uh, uh, hydraulically operated and we have the hydraulic pressure has been broken on them so you can actually move them up and down you want to take a look at the radiator while you're under there and make sure there's no birds in there or stuff like that rabbits and, and other kind of animals and then uh, we'll come around and uh, check the props there, these would all these would be removed, and there isn't much you can check. Uh, you're, you're looking for uh, zeuses that are not tight, stuff like that. Check the propeller just for a, a smoothness, and you'd want to be sure that this thing was out. And uh, again, you check your uh, uh, check the main uh, main main screw. And you come around on this side and do the same. You get in here and you look around for loose, loose uh, lines, um, anything that doesn't look there. Oh yeah, and on the landing gear you want to be sure that this thing isn't flat. It has a certain, you want to make sure there's a gap here on the, uh, on the Oloyo strut so that it's not down here flat or it's not stuck way up here and the airplane would be cocked sideways like that. Uh, not much else you can check just to make sure you know it's everything's working. Again the guns the same thing. Uh, again on this side you you would check your tank and just make sure it's hooked up properly and and uh, look for any visual reference of a problem. And on this side if uh, if you had a, a pedo, pedo head to cover on it, it would be removed, your crew chief would remove it, but if it wasn't, you want to be sure and take that off because it will interfere with the uh, airspeed uh, indication properly. Smooth leading edge, come on out here, same thing. Check all this going back. You get on the trim tab again, flaps, and again, you want to make sure all these doors and all these things are attached. And in particular, he wanted that to be sealed properly. And uh, come down in here. Now, when you come by the radiator, uh, the thing that I always look for when I first walk up on the airplane is to make sure that this uh, scoop is in what we call the open position. That's that's manually wide open. And so you knew that the controls are set properly, but we always double checked them. Uh, this is a tie down hole that goes through there. Just make sure that the airplane isn't been tied isn't tied down. Come around here, leading edge. Uh, The uh, B models that we had, the Bs and the Cs, uh, did not have this strake on it. Uh, they came right down here like that to the wing. And the, these, are, uh, these were a field mod. They came on some of the late production airplanes, but they were added uh, afterwards. Uh, Jack had a standard uh, tail and decided to add this uh, ventral to improve the directional uh, flying qualities of the airplane. You got the leading edge, counterbalance. All you're doing is just checking for, see that everything is here. Uh, 
trim tab. Come around here, here's the rudder tab and the rudder. And then you come around this side, same stuff. Check the wing back and forth. And then uh, you're back here. You wanna just check your tail wheel, make sure it's inflated properly and the doors are unobstructed. And again, here's what we check. You make sure that that thing is wide open. That's real important. And the last thing on this side, you have the fuselage tank uh, thing. You wanna make sure it's closed and sealed properly. Okay, from uh, this point, you would uh, gather up your parachute. Uh, you might even be wearing it, be a back, sh back chute. And you uh, mount the airplane from this side, or you could come up the uh, strut on the front, and then uh, we'll go get in the cockpit, and I'll give you a kind of a run, a run around the cockpit, showing uh, where all the switches are and things like that. Thank mm -hmm. you.